<laughs> Not used to Zoom with fun. All right, Coach, if you want to just go ahead and lead off and talk a little bit about, you know, your initial thoughts on the signing class and then to the, everyone in the group, um, use the raise hand function and we'll take some questions after Coach's statement. Yeah, I mean, I thought our class, we got bigger up front and we got longer in the back end, uh, linebacker included. And I think that was one of our goals was to become a bigger defense, a bigger offense and bigger defense. We need to become a bigger team. Uh, the games that really got out of control for us were when we faced size. So we tried to attack that, uh, you know, to, to clean that up. So up front wise, you know, we got a lot of guards and inside guys. We still have to address the tackle position. Uh, you know, we signed one tackle, but we got to get we got to get more tackles in this next class in this next uh, this next two and a half weeks. Uh, at tight end, I think we got bigger, uh, and you know, we wanted guys who could put their hand in the dirt and block somebody and then be a threat in vertical play action. And I think we did that. Uh, and then we also got a guy who can flex out uh, and kind of be a hybrid wide outside in, which I think we got that too. So I think we got kind of the best of both worlds there. Wide receiver, somebody who gets open. I think we have some size and we have some speed on the roster. So we were really just the best available there. We didn't need to fill a specific spot. So I think we just took who we felt was the best player uh, in that role, uh, best players in that role. Uh, D-line. Obviously, we got to continue to get bigger. That's one thing. Uh, Ramar is going to be a gigantic kid, a uh, gigantic guy. He's still growing into his body. But that's got to be something we continue to address is the size. Our edge guys, very, very athletic. That was something I was very pleased with was the athleticism we signed at edge. I think both those guys can rush the passer as freshmen uh, in the Big 12. Uh, the ability to stop the run and play base downs will be, you know, that's another question for them, but the ability to make an impact as freshmen uh, on the edge on third down sub packages, I think are there both crazy explosive uh, linebackers. Obviously we signed, you know, one and then a couple from the portal, but we wanted to get speed and athleticism. Uh, and then we still need to sign one guy who's a little bit bigger. So we're still, I think we got that uh, with Martel. We got that with a couple of the transfers uh, and then back end. I think the back end was phenomenal how we recruited the back end. Uh, the size, the speed, the length, the the work ethic of those guys, the fact that they're all showing up early. Uh, don't be shocked to see a wave of, of some of these young guys play for us in the back end early. Awesome. All right, we'll go to questions. Starting with Chris. Yeah, Kenny, just wanted to get your thoughts about the the evolution of recruiting and this this first full year cycle that you have and how has that been relative to kind of what you thought it might be like and in, in what ways were you able to be successful working within that paradigm? Yeah, you kind of went in and out a little bit. So I think I heard it all, but how it kind of is changing in the whole year about recruiting. Uh, well, the rules change all the time. So before you can't take a kid who's got a one for one transfer, who's already transferred. So we take two kids, Xavier and Alfred and Jake Smith, and we say, okay, they may not be able to play, but in year two, we're going to get some superstars. Okay, well, now they're saying there's a chance that those kids do play next year. So we turn down a kid that was like that at a position, and then two days later we find out he could become eligible. He's already committed somewhere else, which sucks. So you always have to adapt to the game that's changing. They went from an 85 counter to an unlimited counter. So what does that mean? It means you can oversign. Because it means you have to anticipate your roster dwindling after spring ball. You have to, you can't just get to 65 or 70 and then 15 high school kids come and replace. You have to have a plan to always get 85 to 95 on your roster based off who you think may leave after spring. You have to be able to project. Otherwise, you're going to be stuck under numbers. And I think that's the challenge uh, of it right now. I think being here a year, allowed us to recruit better prospects, like more talent, more size, more speed. We weren't finding the diamonds in the rough as much. Always we were finding these guys that we had to win some battles for. And those are the guys that have the measurables. Uh, but like I tell people, recruiting, if you're a good recruiter, it's not a one-year process. It's a three to two-year process. So your best class should not be year one. It should not be year two. It should actually be years three and four. Because if you're not talking to somebody in the 26th class right now, if you're not having him call you, you can't call him. But if you're not slowly building that relationship today, somebody is. So I think 
the ability of the players we're going to be able to sign are going to get better. And, you know, we were three and nine and we still put together a really good class. Well, another year of relationships with guys and a better year on the field. I think the the standards only going to get raised. Uh, you know, I, I truly, I was talking to somebody before this call, we should be a top two team in recruiting top three team in recruiting in this league. Um, you know, I don't think we did a great job. I thought we were average and I don't know exactly where we finished up, but I think it was the top half. Like that's the standard is I want to finish one through three and with guys that we evaluated that were good enough and finish one through three every year. And we're not there yet. Hode. Hi, Kenny. Um, in terms of the approach, uh, the transfer portal versus uh, just recruiting high, high school kids, would it be fair to say that the transfer portal uh, additions have to be the the plug and play, especially at positions of need. And for the most part, the high school players, which I know some of them are are definitely going to be in the rotation in 2024, but those are more the uh, foundational pieces uh, building for the future. I don't know because so many young high school kids transfer. So I think you, you can't put a transfer kid in a bottle that all transfer kids are the same. Uh, you know, a, a transfer with four years left is a freshman. So you have to put that kid in a different category. Uh, a transfer with three years left, kind of he's kind of a freshman. He's an NFL freshman if the guy plays three years and, and leaves. So I don't think you can put, oh, we're, we take a priority in high school. We take a priority in the portal. I think you say we take a priority in age groups. How are we balancing our roster with ages? Uh, some positions you can, some positions it's harder to, but I would say that's really, when you look at what we're trying to do, we don't like to take a lot of one-for-ones out of the portal. I don't, that's, that's not my, the model that I want to create. Maybe in two years from now, when we're a, a, a one player away from saying, if we get this guy, holy cow, and we have a strong enough culture in place, yes. Right now, you know, maybe two, three guys, maybe that have one year left, we're going to take guys that can help build this thing, uh, you know, two years, three years out. So in years three and four, uh, we're firing on all cylinders. Michelle? Hi, Kenny. We talked earlier about the offensive line, and obviously that was an issue this year. Do you feel like you have enough offensive linemen now and what other positions of need do you still see addressing again? Yeah, uh, O-line, I think we still need some length. You know, I think we got some big, bad, fill in the blank of the next word, uh, dudes who are going to road rage people. Uh, but I think we need some length to tackle still. Uh, that would be the one thing, you know, with Emmett coming back off injury and Bram coming back off injury. Max, who's going to be a superstar. I think Max is going to be an NFL guy. But you've got guys coming back off injury. We need more length. Uh, so we'll still find go find ourselves a tackle that could add to that length uh, that we need. Uh, and then from a other positions, defensive line-wide, uh, with the loss of BJ, you know, I think we still have to replace that with an older-ish guy, somebody that can come in and, because our two freshmen don't get here till the summer. You can't count on one of them on base downs yet. So you got to get an older guy or maybe with two, three years left. Uh, maybe that's the guy who has one year left. I don't know to come in here and be an impact player uh, for us at edge in the rotation. And then linebacker, you'd like to get one more guy and then D tackle. You'd like to get one more guy. So to summarize it, I would say length of tackle and size on the D line at linebacker are the four spots that we're trying to fill hopefully before spring ball starts. So does that mean you just mentioned Emmett, and I think we were unsure whether he was coming back or not. So he is coming back? Yes, Emmett is coming back. My fault. I knew that like week four. My fault. I should have probably said something. Brad? Hey, Kenny. Um, when you look through this class top to bottom, regardless of position, do you were there any common characteristics that were kind of a through line th uh, throughout the, the class? Good people that love football. That's the common characteristic. Uh, you know, we're not going to trick somebody to come here. Uh, we're not going to try to go and put on a full court press to somebody that doesn't want to be here. Uh, we want people who want to be here that are good people. Because uh, nowadays, signing day is just the uh, bond between two people that what you told me to get you here is going to happen. That's it. It can change tomorrow. 
Kids get out of their NIL, their letter of intent all the time. Uh, kids transfer after year one all the time. So if you're not genuine in this process anymore, if if you're still in the, the mindset of we're going to recruit and then de-recruit. Oh, yeah, it's de-recruitment season. Yeah, it's basically you just your roster is just going to continue to dwindle every year. So I think good people who want to be here uh, and that love football, that's the characteristics and the football side of it. We wanted to get bigger and longer. And I think we addressed a, a good amount of those needs. Jordan. Morning, Kenny. Um, in, in terms of uh relief, what, what do you see for him? Um, how he fits into this offense? I know that he was recruited uh, to USC as a running back and then transitioned to a wide receiver, but, but how do you see him kind of fitting in and what can he bring to this offense? Yeah, he's a running back in my mind. Uh, he is going back in my history. He's Kenny Gainwell. Uh, that's who he reminds me of that I had with Memphis who's now playing for the Eagles uh, where he's a running back that you can flex out in the slot and create matchups. Uh, I love playing basketball on grass and trying to get running backs and tight ends matched up with players who can't cover them. Uh, we really didn't have that last year to a point uh, all the time, uh, just due to how people were personnel personnel us with our tight end position. They were treating our tight end position like a wide out. So you couldn't really gain a plus one or, or create a, a false matchup at that spot. And then our running backs were physical downhill guys uh, who aren't wideouts, you know. So I think getting a guy like getting a guy like Relique allows us to kind of dictate a little bit to the defense and create really plus matchups uh, when he does flex out. But he's a running back. He's 184 pounds, and like I told him, he needs to be 190. He can carry that easily. Uh, he's a he's a ball of muscle. So I have no worry in the world about his size. The size is not an issue at all with him playing running back. Cooper. Morning coach. Uh, I know you talked about your defensive backs and kind of the corners that you got earlier on, but could you just kind of touch about, you know, the impact that Brian Carrington made in this process? Uh, you know, in a lot of sites, he was ranked as, you know, one of the top recruiters in the big 12. Yeah. He's a stud. He's an elite relationship builder. Um, he's a really good person and he's elite with people. He understands people. He motivates people. I think, you know, I think coaching and recruiting correlate together because at the end of the day, recruiting is building trust and building relationships to get somebody to trust to come play for you. Coaching is building trust and building relationships to get somebody to go play hard for you and listen to you. So I think his same traits that make him a good recruiter uh, are going to make him get better and better and better as a football coach. So I, I, yeah, he's a game changer for us. Code. Kenny, I know that uh, there are a lot of impressive um, traits to this class, but I was uh, mostly impressed with the uh, uh, Polynesian pipeline that, that, that you guys were able to build. I know, and you know this too, uh, from being an alumnus, it's something that ASU fans have wanted for a long, long time and really um, sometimes dumbfounded how a lot of cold area schools are able to get so many more Polynesian players uh, than, uh, than, than ASU. Can you talk about uh, those efforts, um, you know, really all the way to the start of the recruiting cycle, uh, and then materializing yesterday? Yeah, I mean, between Coach Chaga, Coach Iguano, Coach Nick, uh, and then Coach Cooper, and then Coach Regal. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, they're good kids. You know, I know they're Polynesian, and that's the pipeline, and we're, and we're trying, but really we're just trying to recruit good kids. And I think the culture we're creating of be a good person, work really hard. Uh, we don't practice on Sundays. I think all of that stuff aligns – uh, to be really attractive to that community of people. And I think when you have a guy like Coach Sango who's so respected and Coach Iguano who's so respected and Coach Nick who's so respected, uh, that the combination of the culture we're creating uh, and those people kind of stamping the culture we're creating, I think it's uh, something that we'll continue to do. And I think it's a great advantage heading into the Big 12, being the furthest school west, essentially, uh, that doesn't have to play in Rutgers. No offense to Rutgers, but I'm just saying the flight time to all the way out there, who doesn't have to fly all the way out there for their families. Uh, it's still feasible for families to go watch their son or daughter play most games out of the year uh, here at Arizona, and you can live in warm weather and have a direct flight to the Phoenix airport that's six minutes away uh, from the campus. So all those things putting together, I think that's something that I'm fired up about, and I think it's going to continue. Chris? 
Yeah, Kenny. So how much do you anticipate newcomers impacting your two deep or your starting lineup just overall? And in what in what positions do you think that will have the, the, the most impact? Mid years, quite a bit. Uh, I think the guys who show up in, in uh, January here in two weeks, quite a bit. Uh, D-line, I think the top four of the D-line, I think we have guys who can come in and do it right now. Uh, linebacker core, I think two of the linebackers we got in the portal, I think both those guys are going to be coming in and asked to make a difference now. I think at the corner position, they're going to be asked to come in and compete early, uh, like early, early. Uh, and then obviously getting Ed back, who's a really good football player, is only going to get better. Uh, with him, I think our corner position is is you know trending in the right direction, and then you get all those young bucks that are going to be here early and see which guy is it not too big for as a true freshman. I think we're going to know that early. I think we're going to know which true freshman in the back end uh, are prepared for this and which is it going to take a little bit of time to learn and grow. Uh, but you know, with the back end, uh, I feel pretty good about our safety position. Uh, especially not as much impact, I would say. Uh, Kamari could come in here and shake some sh things up and move some people around positionally, which may be able to flex Shamari to play some nickel, which would be an ideal situation with his cover school skills and physicality. Uh, but we don't know any of that yet. But I could definitely see that safety spot, depending on the freshman, depending on Kamari, depending on JoJo, uh, kind of altering in a three-man rotation of how do we get the three best on the field. Uh, o, o line wise, I expect those guys to come in and compete early, early, early. We need to get bigger and we sign bigger dudes. Tight end wise, those guys will come in and play early. Uh, running back wise, same thing. I think we have versatility. So I truly think all those guys that are coming in mid year uh, have a chance to make an early impact uh, on the team. The guys who come in in the summer, that's a little harder. You know, hopefully they can find a role that's, uh, secondary maybe third down pass rush or something like that if they if they aren't ready for it michael yeah coach i was uh obviously i mean special teams and punting i know um you signed canyon i mean coach got to uh canyon floyd out of horizon i mean i know you talk obviously about flipping the field and everything what do you feel how do you feel that um he fits that and can he contribute right away yeah he can he can punt it really far, which is nice. And when I mean, I I watched his highlight, and that dude is an absolute animal. So he's one of the he's one of the sneaky gets in the class. People aren't going to talk about the the punter and the specialist, but at Arizona State, there's been a tradition of elite specialists. And getting a guy that I roll can be that again, and can flip the field forty eight yards, forty six yards at a time, instead of our thirty four ish, thirty five ish. Is an absolute game changer. That's a field goal a game. A uh, field goal a punt. So if you punt six times, you just change 60-something yards of field difference, which completely changes the game. So I'm fired up for him. Also being a local boy, I think that's awesome uh, that he's going to be able to play in front of his own family. So huge gift for us, and I'm fired up about it. Michelle? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, can you tell me, Kenny, out of your se uh, 17 high school kids, how many of those might enroll early in January so they can play spring? Uh, roughly nine. So the DB position heavily. There's still a couple that are up in the air. Uh, you know, Martel's still up in the air. Uh, Chris is still – or not Chris. Well, he's still up in the air. There's – we don't know yet. We're getting final grades. Uh, so I don't want to talk too prematurely. I would say roughly nine, eight, give or take one or two each way. But we'll know more here after high school final grades get submitted. Every school is a little different when they get submitted, and then they got to go through the app process. Cooper? Coach, I saw you talk to Adam Gorney yesterday, and, you know, he talked to you about, you know, recruiting in-state kids. How do you feel you did recruiting the in-state kids this year from Arizona? And, you know, what is your plan of attack, you know, going forward to get those kids to stay in-state? Yeah, I always knew it takes two years. I wasn't concerned. I mean, yeah, we did everything we could. I think we sent the whole house to go see a specific prospect in-state uh, just to show the commitment to the state, the whole team, I mean, or the whole coaching staff. Uh, but I knew year one, you only have one year to build a relationship, and it's harder to do that. Uh, with an in-state kid. So year two, we've been on these guys, uh, you know, for almost two years now, 
by the time they sign. So we would have had as even of a shake as anybody to get guys here. So I anticipate us making a few splashes uh, with the top dudes in the state this year. That's what I hope for. That's what I, that's what my expectation is. And uh, if we don't, it's, it's, you know, I failed uh, when it comes to recruiting in state and then we'll have to reevaluate, uh, you know, our process because I'm pouring everything I can into the state, into recruiting the state. So when you get two years to recruit a kid, two years to recruit a class, uh, if you're not getting those guys, then there's a bigger, deeper issue of why you're not. And then you have to reevaluate that. But uh, I fully anticipate uh, making waves in this year's class in Arizona, uh, being in you know year two of this cycle. So I'm actually fired up about it. Uh, it actually, it's, it's the beginning of what I know you can do here. And there are certain kids in particular that can actually change the game and uh, for us, not just now, but forever, they can change the game forever. And they know who they are. Uh, Chaz? Good morning, Kenny. Um, so my question is, how is does it differ the way that you recruit a kid from high school as someone out of the transfer portal? Is it vastly different or are a lot of the pitches that you make to these guys the same? For me, it's the same. It's just you got to get to know them faster. Uh, it's like dating versus speed dating. I mean, you have two weeks to get to know these guys. Two. Sometimes one. They make an early decision. Uh, now it's dead. So anybody who goes in the portal, you may not even meet them. You may just meet them on FaceTime. That's it. And that dude's going to come play for you. So um, I think the key is, you know, what I just firmly believe in is that's honesty and trying to help dudes. Like, there are kids in this year's class that were freshmen that were five stars that went in the portal that called me and I helped them go somewhere else. It didn't fit our, what I was trying to do here, but I helped them guide their way to someplace else. It's not all about who you sign uh, from that perspective. It's just about helping people. And I truly believe if you help enough people and you're honest enough, you will reap what you sow and good things will happen to you. And uh, I mean, there was a, I mean, there was a couple of four stars that we were in on and we missed. And I'm like, dang, you know, we were one year short of a relationship with those kids and other staffs had it and we just couldn't, we just couldn't beat it. And we tried everything we could. And then there were some kids that were, you know, a top 150 kid who calls me and says, coach, I know it's last minute, but is ASU still an option? And I'm like, no, it's not. Because we don't have the relationship necessary. This isn't where you want to be. You made that perfectly clear earlier in the process. And so I think for us, it's finding the kids who want to be here, recruiting them the same. Do you have to recruit them harder and faster when they're in the portal? Yes, because you don't know as much about them. But it's the same vetting process, the same type of kid, and and uh, the same vision and plan. Julia? Morning, Coach. Um, obviously, you got a lot on your plate, but just how much do you enjoy the process of recruiting and just getting some new players and new blood into your system? Yeah, I mean, I love some of it. I don't like other parts of it. Uh, I don't like when schools promise kids fake things and you lose a kid because you're honest and another school is full of crap. I don't like that. Uh, I don't like that. I think the rules are are changing so what your plan is could constantly change by the day I don't like those things i love the relationships so i absolutely love the relationships i love building relationships i love seeing seeing kids mature and grow uh and just throughout from uh, being a 16 year old to an 18 year old and i love that piece of it that's awesome for me uh that's what i like about it i don't like uh kind of what it's become in terms of Tell kids whatever it takes to get them on your campus and and uh, promise whatever you want to promise. I just – I can't do that. I don't like that. Uh, it's not what I'm about. So I love some of it. I don't like the others. Michael? Yeah, Coach, to kind of piggyback off that and what you said earlier about, you know, with the changing of conferences and out-of-conference games, do you feel that – I mean, building the relationships, like you said, with kids you're recruiting, if you lose out on them – to a school, you know, say at SC or UCLA, where, like you said, those out-of-conference games are 3,700 miles away. Do you feel a lot of kids more so now are going to take that into consideration and you might land a few more that 
maybe we're thinking of going there, but just don't want to travel. Like I said, for almost 4,000 miles to play a, at a conference game. hundred uh, percent. You know, nowadays, you know, different schools can attract different level of quote unquote star players. Right. Uh, just because it's the nature of the profession, the nature of the beast. And we should recruit the best players in the country constantly. And if we don't get those players in high school, it's not over. Those players could be right back in the portal a year later, and whoever had a relationship with them has the best chance to get them. So now more than ever, recruiting is harder because in the past you would identify the category of kid that you could recruit. Oh, okay, this kid has offers from Alabama and Georgia. He is from Louisiana. LSU wants him too. Are we really going to chase that ghost? Well, now you do because that kid may end up in the portal and all the schools, all those schools may not take them in the portal, but who still kept recruiting them from the big 12? Maybe nobody, because maybe everybody gave up and maybe you're the only school that still has that relationship with that kid when he enters. So you have to be able to recruit more kids than ever uh, because they're, their times and changes of when you could get them could be different. So recruiting is harder than it's ever been. It's more time demanding than it's ever been. Uh, it never ends. Like I'm, I'm at home right now, but these kids, the transfers until they're on campus, they could go wherever they want. There's no letter of intent that locks them into your school. It's not like high school. So it doesn't end like Christmas doesn't end. New year's doesn't end. It continues. So you better be genuine. You better be real with these guys. Otherwise, you may sign them, and then they may leave, and it doesn't matter to begin with. Jordan? Uh, Coach, what went into the um, recruitment of Sam, and how do you think this quarterback room is looking heading into the season? Yeah, my exit interview with Jaden, I said, hey, I'm going to take a transfer quarterback uh, to compete. Uh, we need competition in that room. We need more depth in that room. And uh, he was like, I'm not scared of competition. It's great. It's what you want. Uh, the recruitment of Sam was, hey, come in here and compete. Well, where else are you going to get in? Get going to come in here and compete? And I told him both, you know, I was going to take an older kid. And uh, then when Jaden said he wasn't scared of competition, and Sam was close to not being scared of competition, and he hopped in uh, before that moment, I'm like, wow, I have two freshmen who are both really talented players who aren't scared to compete versus one another. Man, how often do you get that? How often do you get two top 15 players in the country at their position? Not scared to compete. I said, I don't need a senior. We'll take these two guys and I'll ride or die. Hode? Kenny, I know that uh, you made uh, a really concerted effort uh, to uh, increase the uh, NL purse that ASU has. Uh, now looking back at signing day and the NL funds that you had, how pleased are you in both attracting uh, new players uh, with the NIL that you had, as well as retaining the players that you wanted to retain? Yeah, obviously NIL cannot be used to attract prospects uh, or lure prospects to your school. So for us, it's just a more that the guys understand that there is NIL here, there is support here, uh, that our players on our roster uh, do get paid now uh, way more than they did last year, which is fun, which is awesome, which is why we've got to retain uh, a lot of guys. And we haven't had guys, uh, you know, that I've signed really leave here. So I think uh, being able to show them uh, and explain that the fortunes are changing here is unbelievable. And it's a testament to the Valley. It's a testament to the people that love this place, who put together, put hard work into it. Uh, and I just can't thank all of those people enough because it's changing the game. I'll take our last couple of questions, Brad. Kenny, going through the uh, partial cycle last year, you know, what kind of lessons were you able to take away that apply to, you know, not, now that you had a chance to go through this like, kind of first full cycle? Uh, don't reach. But, I mean, part of that last year was we didn't have enough humans on our team. So we had to, like, oh, you're good enough? Okay. Let's do everything we can to get you. Whereas this year it was much more, no, we're filling a little bit more needs. Even though we had to sign a lot of guys, which is part of just taking over the program and, and where we were at a year ago today, um, uh, we still could be way more selective. So I would say don't reach and patience were the two things. And I think based off how we recruited kids last year, based off our high school class this year, uh, based off the retention of the kids that we signed last year 
and transfers last year allowed us to be a little more patient uh, and a little more, you know, specific with what we were trying to get. Jacob. Hey, Kenny, you kind of talked about the relationship building with all the with all the players and just kind of how important is that to continue those relationships with kids who maybe go to different schools because you never know with kind of the movement today how they might pan out in a few years. Hundred percent. I mean, I've recruited just at the quarterback position, you know, ten quarterbacks a year. I sign hopefully one. Am I just gonna say screw these other nine kids that I've talked to for two years? Like that's not no, I build a relationship, I learn about them, I learn about their family. And, you know, I root for them. And if they ever have a question about a coach or, or how I can help them, they know that I can help them. I mean, there were two kids this year who called me and, you know, we weren't taking a 24. It was known. I told them. I said, you know, based off our situation, I promised some people that I'm not going to take a kid in the 24 class. And those kids called me and I, I kind of helped them navigate some rocky situations that is recruiting in college football, you know, they told me this and they're doing this. They promised me this and then this happened and just explain to them the the cold hard truth of this deal. So I think the relationships are key and the relationships now more than ever come back to help you uh, when those kids go in the portal because they know, man, this dude trusted me, even though I couldn't play for this guy and I didn't choose to go to his school, he still helped me. Like there's a level of trust and respect there uh, that hopefully, you know, We'll reap what we sow here in the next year, two years, three years. Last question, Jordan. Uh, Coach, as we've seen this two-time transfer rule get kind of uh, decided, or you know, in in the courts and that sort of thing, how do you think that would change college sports? And if this decision maintains, do you see Xavier and and Jake, you, you trying to get them another year of eligibility or? or anything like that since they did have to sit out and now the, the decision is evolving. I mean, I think for both of those guys, it depends, uh, you know, if they want to be 25 playing college. <laughs> I mean, it's really a personal decision is if, you know, if they want to come back, we'll definitely try to do what we can for a, you know, two or an extension. I mean, both those guys have multiple years left. So if we wanted to get a clock extension for them, I, I'm sure that we could, uh, but they're going to have to make a decision, you know, they have two years to really establish themselves. I think both those guys can be NFL players. So I think they have two years to establish themselves as NFL players and then move on. And if they don't and they're not ready yet, do they want to come back to college or are they ready to move on with their life? So I think that's a decision they're going to have to make, you know, in two years from now. And hopefully they don't have to make it. Hopefully they're both Sunday players by then. And I believe they both can be. I think they're both special players. That's why we took, that's why we took them last year, knowing they probably couldn't help us this year is because we knew we weren't doing we weren't building everything for last year we were building for the future and even though we we took a hit not having two of our better players play for us um now i have a smile on my face when i see him because i'm like they actually get to play for us and we actually get to see jake smith get tackled by somebody and that fired me up and i get to see Xavion, who led our team in interceptions last spring play safety and get turnovers and those are two exciting things if that rule holds, how does that affect roster construction and how you approach that? If that rule holds, uh, it's fine. It just goes back to the relationships and the honesty. It goes back to there is like there is no signing day. Like there's a day that you pick to go to your first school, but there what's the there's no signing day or there's no every year is just an, a new spot. Uh, and the interesting dynamic right now in college athletics is there's teams. Um, even right now that have come summer, we'll have 97 guys, 95 guys on scholarship right now. Well, that means 10 people have to leave. Well, what if those 10 people don't want to leave? What happens? And that's the dynamic we're at in college football right now is the way, the more freedom the portal creates actually creates more pressure for these kids to leave and it's somewhat a negative because it forces teams to push out players they don't think are going to play for them and those players aren't probably going to play on Sundays to begin with so you're pushing and hurting an act the academics of kids that probably won't have a profession in this anyways which is somewhat sad and but that's the nature of the rules that we're creating is you have to oversign 
you have to bank on kids leaving. But what happens if kids don't want to leave? And now you're at 93 scholarships come the start of summer. What happens? You have to get back down to 85. And that's when the, what is that saying? The rubber meets the road. Uh, luckily for us, we're not at that point. Uh, we're always going to stay at the 85 no matter what. Because that's just not how I believe in, in treating people. But there's a lot of places that do. And it's a rough, rough world uh, right now. Awesome. Thanks so much, Coach. Happy holidays. Appreciate it.